Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> There's a lot of fun stuff going out there today. We're having such a good time. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and also virtually. My name is Kim Hayden, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous peoples, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community and with each other in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and the land itself. Today's service is led by Senior Minister Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart with music by music director Dr. Zaneda Robles. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary and in the narthex. See the newsletter for the schedule of holiday events in December at Neighborhood. Please note that on Sunday, December 24th, Christmas Eve, there'll be no morning services, only evening services at five o'clock and eight o'clock. Stop by the pastoral care table today to receive free flu and pneumonia vaccinations for adults and free flu vaccinations for children six and under. This wonderful opportunity is available until 1 p.m. today and is sponsored by Pasadena Village in partnership with our pastoral care team. Also tomorrow, join us for a Hanukkah celebration at 6 p.m. All ages are invited. Bring a snack to share for the evening of food and games in the living room neighborhood house. Another announcement, if you happen to have gotten a text message from someone who you think might be Reverend Omega asking for a gift card for Apple gift cards, that wasn't her. Uh, she would never do that. That is spam, um, and a number of folks have received it, so uh, please ignore that. If you have questions, come and see me or Reverend Omega afterwards. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email, post in the narthex, or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
In these days, separated into a before and an after, we learn to live in the in-between, between ways of being and knowing held in the waiting of winter, where we know all plans and predictions are partial and where we learn to pivot as a spiritual practice, writes my colleague, the Reverend Gretchen Haley. For us, gathering like this for this hour, it is a way to mark time, to know ourselves here now, straddling worlds, maybe for our whole lives. Here we revel in the curiosity and we let learning wash over us. Here we refuse to be seduced by certainty. Here we praise the mystery. Here we give thanks for all that remains hidden in this liminal time, all that grows beneath the earth and behind the stars and beyond our view, beyond our lifetime. Let us know ourselves as sowers of seeds, tenders of possibility, called to presence and partnership beyond our imaginations. With this flame this morning, we remember our promise to stay in relationship, to repair what has been broken, and to do more than just survive, to insist on joy and to lead in love. Come, let us worship together this morning. This morning marks the second Sunday of Advent. In the Christian tradition, Advent is the beginning of the church year, recognizing the transforming power of God in the world and looking forward to the birth of Jesus and spiritual light. And Christianity is not alone in celebrating this time of year. Hanukkah, of course, happening now, solstice and Kwanzaa all involve candles, fire, and lights as parts of their celebrations. Each week until Christmas, we are lighting a new candle on our Advent wreath. The circle of greenery reminds us of the eternal cycle of life without beginning or end. And the candles remind us that we are called to be a light in this world. The light of Advent grows brighter and brighter, guiding us towards personal peace and joy and more love. This morning, we light the second candle. We light this candle as a symbol of our longing for peace. We can bring our hope into the world if we practice peacemaking. Our caring community aspires to be a source of freedom from violence and exclusion. May we become, as poet June Jordan wrote, the ones we have been waiting for. Together, may we strive to create everlasting peace. Our opening hymn is number 244 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. We'll sing the first verse in unison, followed by parts on the other three verses, if you are inclined. Please join us.
Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhood's Director of Spiritual Exploration. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. First, I just wanted to uh, make sure it was clear with regard to Pasadena Village and the vaccines being offered on the patio this morning. The youngest age that they have a vaccine for, uh, and it's the flu vaccine primarily that they're giving today, uh, the youngest age they have the vaccine for is six years old. Um, I did inquire about that for families. So ages six and up are welcome to be vaccinated against the flu this morning. And I hear there's like a Romans gift card in the deal or something, so check that out, you know. Um, so uh, I'm having the children and youth stay with uh, their uh, caring adult who is with them this morning. Um, um, I'm reading a story based on the Christmas song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, which I, we probably have all heard that song at some point before, but it actually has a really interesting story that goes with it, and I'm going to be reading the story of the song known as Longfellow's Christmas. And this was originally narrated by Edward K. Herman, Edward Herman, the actor, with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and Orchestra at Temple Square. You can still find it on YouTube. If you want to go back and catch Edward Herman reading this story, just go to YouTube and look up Edward Herman Christmas and it comes right up. This was written by David Warner, and uh, the music that it was originally set to was by Mac Wilburn. Um, I should preface it by saying that uh, the, the uh, time when Longfellow was writing his poetry was during the Civil War. Uh, which comes up in the story. Um, and the song, which is based on a poem by Longfellow, uh, references goodwill toward men, but at that time, goodwill toward men get, meant goodwill toward mankind, goodwill toward everyone. So here we go. In the winter of 1860, Cambridge, Massachusetts, captures the essence of an American Christmas. Under starry skies and between snow-laden pines, proud New England houses push their way through a thick white blanket. Their yellow-orange windows, like Christmas candles, are reflected in the ice-bound Charles River. In the silence of falling snow, sleigh bells and laughter crescendo as the Longfellow family, huddled in winter wool, is whisked along behind glossy horses. And above them, a thousand bare branches release a shower of sparkling snow. Five children giggle with delight. And ringing down cobbled lanes across fields and through the wooded hills and valleys are the bells. Single steeple bells in bundles of carolin bells playing those old familiar carols that make Christmas Christmas. To men and women of goodwill everywhere, this is the music of hope and peace. The following year, in 1861, America will need that music to counter the drum and bugle of civil war. Rising from the strife and the plaintive songs of divided families, songs for lively boys who steal off to war and broken young men carried back to their homes and, too often, to an early grave. Still, 
for the Longfellow family of Cambridge, summer comes and it, as it always has. For the five children, outings to the seashore, long walks under leafy canopies, and happy hours in the family home seem to promise that this summer will not, cannot end. Then, on Tuesday, July 9th, a fire in the Longfellow home claims the life of the children's mother, Fanny. Trying to rescue her, her husband, Henry, is severely burned on his hands and face. Three days later, Fanny, the beloved wife, is buried in the eight, on the 18th anniversary of their wedding day, while he is confined to his bed, fighting to live, fighting to want to live. For Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, as one war rages without, another rages within. For the next two years, Christmases come and go. Henry writes, how inexplicably sad are the holidays. A Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is not the case for me. Perhaps someday, Will give, God will give me peace. And then Henry learns that his eldest son, Charles, who ran away to join the army, has been critically wounded in battle. Henry rushes to Washington to bring his son home, and after days of searching, he finds him barely alive. With the outbreak of war, Fanny's terrible death, and now two years later, his son desperately clinging to life, we should not be surprised that on Christmas Day, 1863, Henry reaches for his pen and writes, It was as if an earthquake rent the heartstones of a continent. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Reading his words today, we ask, when conflict rages, pain, grief, and loneliness overwhelm us, where is the music of hope and peace? For Henry, the answer to that question has everything to do with Christmas. After Fanny's death, he had written, so strong is the sense of her presence upon me that I should hardly be surprised to look up now and see her in the room. Death is a beginning, not an end. On that Christmas morning, it is clear to Henry that war, injury, and even death are not an end. The rising sun turns the icy river to silver and the windows of the Longfellow home to gold. Henry's children, hunt, huddled in winter wool, are whisked past snowy fields, through wooded hills and valleys, along the road to home. They look up, blinking and giggling in the falling snow, and they hear the sounds that make Christmas Christmas, they hear the bells. From his desk, Henry too hears them. He plunges his pen into fresh ink, joyfully drawing it across the sheet of snow white paper and writes, I heard the bells on Christmas day. Their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. 
In those bells, the message is clear. On Christmas Day, a child was born in a stable. Of that child, Henry writes, though in a manger, though draw breath, thou draw breath, thou art great, greater than life and death. And so he is. He writes, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, and right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. As the bells ring on, Henry dips his pen again and again, because Christmas lives on, Fanny lives on, Charles lives on, a nation lives on, and we, each one of us, may live on as well in hope and peace forever. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Goodwill to men. Amen. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just inside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This service, our gifts go to World Central Kitchen. Here to tell us more is Share the Plate Committee member Alex McAdams. And before we do that, we're going to sing our kids out. So hang in a second. <laughs> Both of them left. Doesn't that feel better? <laughs> so, okay, World Central Kitchen, once again, here to tell us is Share the Plate Committee member, Alex McAdams. We all know the challenges and struggles that Gaza has faced. It's a region that has endured hardships that are hard to comprehend. But the, in the midst of adversity, there's a shining light, World Central Kitchen. World Central Kitchen isn't just an organization that provides meals, it's a beacon of hope. In Gaza, where every meal matters, they've been on the ground tirelessly working to ensure that people not only have food on their plates, but also a sense of dignity and comfort. Trucks loaded with food and water are now reaching the World Central Kitchen team in Gaza. They are delivering the desperately needed aid to Anera, their partner on the ground, who is distributing the items to thousands of Palestinians displaced by the conflict. Through these first World Central Kitchen convoys, they provided enough canned goods and ingredients, including vegetables and flour, to pre prepare tens of thousands of meals. Getting humanitarian aid into Gaza has been extremely restricted, and food assistance has so far focused on ready-to-eat items. Alongside their partners, they have already provided more than one million hot meals in Gaza. Their trucks deliver water, flour, yeast, canned vegetables, lentils, rice, oil, sardines, tuna, and serving containers. 
They are also providing specially designed wood and charcoal stoves, along with the fuel needed to power them, so their partners can increase hot meal production. Their team opted for these stoves, as fuel like protein are not allowed in humanitarian shipments into Gaza. World Central Kitchen is a global organization providing meals in response to humanitarian, climate, and community crises. In the weeks since the Category 5 Hurricane Otis made landfall along the Pacific coast of Mexico, World Central Kitchen has provided much needed aid from food and water to masa flour and bridge repairs by working alongside local partners and impacted communities. They have worked with 124 partners to provide more than 2 million hot meals and sandwiches, along with 140,000 gallons of potable water. The teams have distributed 160 tons of corn flour so local tortillerias can provide tortillas, a regional staple, for their neighborhoods. This work is in large part possible thanks to countless Mexicans, many, directed impa many directly impacted by the storm, who are supporting the efforts of World Central Kitchen. World Central Kitchen doesn't just parachute into a crisis. They empower local chefs and restaurants to be part of the solution. This lifts up the local economy while providing food that respects cultural traditions. As Chef Imad said, cooking familiar meals provides a sense of home and normalcy. World Central Kitchen doesn't just stop at immediate relief. They are committed to creating sustainable solutions. It's about empowering communities to rebuild and stand on their own feet, fostering a future where they can thrive. So please consider supporting this tremendous organization that is delivering hope one meal at a time, to struggling families in Gaza. Your donation will go a long way toward providing nourishment and dignity when it's needed most. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Will today's volunteers please bring, please bring the plates forward? Thank you for giving generously.
This morning's reading comes from a book entitled Love and Rage, The Path to Liberation Through Anger, written by the Lama Rod Owens, who is a Buddhist teacher in the Kagyu School of Tibetan Buddhism. His practices and writings center the experience of being a queer black man, and his teachers compel us to think about and confront pain and anger and systemic oppression through Buddhism. He offers the following litany as a selection of rituals to participate in, to build resistance, resilience, and sustainability. And yes, I want to acknowledge I am offering a reading on anger by a Buddhist during Advent and Hanukkah, and we can make space for all of those in our practices. So I invite you into a spirit of meditation as I read these rituals for the season. Hear in them that self-kindness is its own sort of survival ritual. What is one act of self-kindness that you can do today to affirm yourself and the complexities of this season. He writes, rise early in the morning and hear in the stillness of morning what you can't hear anytime else. Think of those who have always loved you, reflect on their love and imagine that your silence is saturated with their love. Remember those who have cared for you who ha or who have worked for your happiness and give rise to gratitude for them. Remember those who came before you and helped you to live now. Ask them to abide with you. Call them ancestors. Believe that you are never alone. Cry, dry your tears, and then continue. Repeat if necessary. When you are tired, rest. When hungry, eat. When thirsty, drink. If possible, do this and think that you are taking rest and food and drink, not just for yourself, but for others who cannot. If you choose to make love, surrender to lovers who can also make love to your pain. Avoid people who do not want to do the work of sustainability. Avoid people who intentionally keep you from practicing sustainability. And if you are the person who keeps you from being sustainable, seek out individuals and communities that teach you. Swim in natural water like lakes or ponds and let the water cleanse your spirit. Baptize yourself in the name of whatever helps you to survive and imagine that you are being reborn. Keep being reborn. Go and lie on the earth and let the earth hold you as it holds you. Let it love you. Offer to the earth what you cannot hold. Go and sit with the elders, ask them to tell your stories. Spend time with people who do not want anything from you. Meditate under the light of the moon and imagine that the light is cleansing you. Write down everything you struggle with on a piece of paper and burn it outside. Imagine that you are burning away the obstacles that keep you struggling. Burn sage and lavender and cleanse your body and your personal space. Dwell in spaces that love you. Burn incense and pray. This next piece we sing in Latin. It is called Gaudete, and it is the, the general translation it relates to being joyful in this time of new birth, in this time of transformation, in this time of darkness. There is still abundant joy.
Today's sermon is called The Apocaloptimist. And in a move that many ministers may be loath to admit, I'm going to come right out and tell you that I have given a version, a version, not the same one, a version of this sermon two other times in the past three years. And while it might seem at first glance a decidedly unholiday like approach to the season, marked by joy and peace, it turns out that for one reason or another, it continues to be precisely the right time to talk about the apocalypse. Here's the first paragraph of the sermon that I wrote the first time I gave it in December of 2020. So I'd like to invite you to consider what was happening in the world, December of 2020. I wrote at that time. A few weeks ago, sometime after the elections and before the second round of pandemic lockdowns, while doom scrolling through my various news feeds and social media accounts, two very different items popped up within minutes. This serendipity, this synchronicity caused me to pause in that curious mixture that only a year like 2020 can produce awe, tearfulness, chagrined, weariness, bordering on despair, and a little bit of sarcasm. So now I will rewrite the beginning of that sermon for this time we are in right now. Recently, while doom scrolling (laughs) through my various news feeds and social media accounts, about climate despair and increased seasonal illness rates and two devastating and seemingly unending and terribly lethal wars. I was reminded of a sermon that I gave in December of 2020. This serendipity caused me to pause in that curious mixture that only a year like 2020, whoop, scratch that, 2021, nope, 2023, can produce awe, tearfulness, chagrined weariness, bordering on despair, and a little bit of sarcasm. My dear ones, what a three years it has been. What a year it has been. How things have changed and how they have not changed. Now, the two things that I was referencing that had popped up side by side when when reading and preparing for this sermon were a poem and a meme. I'm going to talk about the meme in just a moment. First, the poem. 
It's an original poem written by my dear friend and colleague, the Reverend Laura Solomon. She titled her poem, Praise Song, and it begins like this. I'll read it in three parts for you this morning. This is the first part. This is a song of praise. There is no singing or talk of God. This is the broken open praise, the searching for breath praise, the looking for a moment to still, grieving this world, angry, righteous, passionate praise without object. This is the gritty praise of living in a world on fire. I hear in those words a determination of active, of intentional joy amidst all of the uncertainty of our world right now. And this year has felt, this past three years has felt like a series of moments on fire. And yet we still find ways to gather and be intentional about joy. We still find ways to praise. Now the second thing that came through immediately after when I saw that poem was a meme. And if you're not familiar with those are, they're often pictures or witty phrases that we pass around on social media. This meme features an image of a mountain top off in the distance, a cliche and vaguely inspirational but not quite image used on motivational posters, if you're familiar with those. And the caption states in bold, apocaloptimist, Someone who knows it's all going to hell, but still thinks things will turn out okay. <laughs> and those of you in Generation X may also have your heart beat a little bit to R.E.M.'s song, This is the End of the World, and I know it, and I feel fine. What a moment to consider those two together, this praise song of grittiness, and that apocaloptimist meme. What both of these point to is a certain kind of resilience in the face of change that some of us have never had to develop, others have, but some of us who have lived particularly privileged lives have never had to develop that. And I wanna be clear, this isn't change in the end of things. This isn't a pretty change. This isn't the beautiful change of the leaves outside on the trees or the butterflies that emerge from their caterpillar muck. No, this is gritty, harsh change. I'm reminded of Octavia Butler's writings. Many of you are familiar as she is from here. God is change, is disorienting. Butler, of course, is a black American author of science fiction that centralizes this violence uh, as it is done to black bodies amidst social upheaval. And she wrote in Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents about a storyline that takes place in 2025. If you haven't read those books recently, I encourage you to do so. They are grim, they are haunting, they are a little scary. And yet there is hope, there is. Because the apocalypse in these books is the great unveiling. It is a revelation of truths. It's the end of many things, of course, but it is biblical, it is cultural, and it signals something to come. My colleague who wrote Praise Song Reverend Solomon writes, but this is a praise song. We stand tiptoe on the precipice, devastated and afraid, hopeless, angry, and frightened. We are lost and in denial. This is our country and we, its citizens. There is no sugarcoating this, but this is a praise song. We live this gorgeous improbability of a world knowing tomorrow will come and will not comfort us. It is the apocalypse, the great unveiling, a revelation of truths. But here is what I am becoming more and more attuned to and what I think Laura's poem hints at as well as the work of Octavia Butler, that the apocalypse is also the great continuing, the improbability of continuing, not finding comfort in tomorrow per se, but continuing on in a search of new truths that are complex and rich and sustaining. 
And that is a lot to try and do by ourselves. It's a lot to do without joy and resilience that we find in our communities like this one. Look how strong these communities are. These communities of communities, as Paula Cole Jones terms it. The power of congregations and other groups like this, large communities composed of smaller circles that help reinforce cultural strength and empowerment. That's the opposite of individuality. That's the opposite of radical and unhealthy independence and exclusion. If we extrapolate that extreme individuality and separation is born of trauma, and it is a trauma response, then the only way through the apocalypse is communally and together. And you are doing this, you have been doing this for some time in a world defined by change, defined by also waiting There is a stillness in waiting. There is an anxiety. There is anticipation in the best sense. This is, of course, the season of Advent, a season of anticipation. And December marks so much for us. It is the rebirth of so much. So even while we, we mourn and we grieve in this apocalyptic time, we grieve and mourn wars, that are tearing families and communities apart. We must take time to praise this rebirth. For I hope you heard in my opening words, there will always be cycles of bad. And the only way through is to have some resilience, some optimism that is fed by praise and fed by intentional and active joy. Last week, some of you may have heard in my sermon about how some theologians and philosophers characterize hope as being different than optimism. Hope, posited one theory, is different from optimism because it does not guarantee an outcome. Optimism, so this theory goes, suggests a preordained outcome, one where we believe that it will somehow probably or improbably be all right and we'll make it through. It is hard to feel optimism right now. Grief and loss are real and destruction is real. But what if? What if optimism is also the acknowledgement that these cycles of pain and grief and change will always happen? That is preordained. That is the definition we can be certain that they will keep happening, and can we still find comfort in the rituals of rebirth and renewal and community? And for those of us who are unable or we cannot mark the ways that we will continue on, then all really is lost. So we must mark them, we must celebrate it, we must intentionally look for joy we must celebrate what we can. In a few days, we will call back the sun and our days will begin to slowly become longer. Many of us are celebrating Hanukkah right now, of course, the festival of lights. And of course, in a few weeks, many of us will celebrate Christmas. And even those among us who don't celebrate the religious of this time of year may find ourselves enjoying the secular trappings of the season by donning our homes in festive lights and perhaps a Yule log or two. And then we will welcome a new year, the ultimate literal and symbolic turning of the page. But in the meantime, we wait. We must embrace the change, but we wait. That is the definition of the apocalypse, the great unveiling, a revelation that takes place, and also the great continuing, the improbability of continuing, of not finding comfort per se, but continuing on and finding specific ways that new truths and new ways of knowing 
come to us complex and rich. So this is the praise song. This is how my colleague's poem ends. So this is the praise song of we who are not enough, of we who deny our holy or whose holy is denied. We divine ourselves. We bless the anger that keeps us here. Firm our feet, reach out our hands and glory our survival. We glory the possibility we glory our despair as we dance with our grief. We praise our hands and our movement and our breath. We praise our grounding, our thinking, our flying. We praise our resisting and weeping. We praise our not aloneness in this fiery, bitter, holy here. So this is my praise song for all of you, my praise song for the peacemakers and those who work for ceasefire. This is my praise song for those of us who work for intersectional justice, those who light candles in the darkness, the doctors and the teachers and the caregivers and the social work workers. This is my praise song for you who continue to care for each other in this space those who volunteer and the Yule log makers and the sidewalk sweepers and the greeters and ushers and the singers. This is my praise song for the dedicated staff here at churches and synagogues and other places of worship who know that there must be resilience based on spirit and soul renewal amidst all of this anxiety, especially during this season. For as the Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson quotes, using the words of June Jordan, a Jamaican American poet, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are not perfect, but we are perfectly fitted to this day. The apocalypse waits for no one. We are the ones we are waiting for because we only have each other to save ourselves. So it may be the end of the world as we know it, and while I might not feel fine about it, I will continue to be an apocaloptimist. Things certainly seem to be going all to heck. And while that may be true, I will also find optimism and strength, and I will be intentional about my rituals of renewal and joy, and I will continue to work for peace, and I ask that you do too. And it will take a while. In fact, it may take forever, and a whole lot of mourning, and effort, and resilience, but also joy. So, I invite you to put up the extra strand of Christmas lights and leave them up until March. <laughs> Whatever you need to do, use the good candles that you put in the back of the closet. Why not? As Lama Rod Owens says, baptize yourself in the name of whatever helps you to survive and imagine that you are being reborn and keep being reborn. The worst thing that can happen, a colleague and a dear friend of mine said, the worst thing is that we go back to the way we were. The second worst thing, he said, is if we stay exactly how we are now. Because change is inevitable. Change, of course, can be painful, but change is possibility. It is rebirth, and we glory that possibility. May it be so. Our closing hymn is number 224 in your gray hymnal or on the screen above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, Let Christmas Come.
Jadim Geiger writes of enfleshed liturgies, peace cannot be imposed from on high. Peace cannot be commanded. The peace of God with us is chaotic and wild and unruly and unpredictable. The peace of God with us is collective. It is liberating us from deadly complicity. Peace is gestating in the darkness. It comes unexpectedly. Peace invites our expectation and demands our participation. Prepare the way for peace with justice. May peace be birthed among, within, and through us this Advent season. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen. Most jolly. 